On August 20th, 2022, a car bomb killed Russian far-right political commentator Daria Dugina on this street in the suburbs of Moscow. Obviously, assassinations are not good for the stability of your country. And while we don't yet know who is responsible for the attack, or whether the actual intended target was her father, Alexander Dugin, who is also a far-right political commentator and just happened to switch cars at the last minute, the situation is likely even worse for Moscow than it seems. With that in mind, let's discuss the four most likely explanations for the attack and what it means for the broader war in Ukraine. Number one, a false flag operation. Let's start with the tinfoil hat theory. This appears to be an unlikely option, but it may also be the most interesting. Under this explanation, Russian intelligence orchestrated the hit to rally support for the war. Both Alexander and Daria were hardliners that believed Russia had been too soft on Ukraine. They advocated for a broader imperial Russia, stretching all the way from Central Europe to the Pacific Ocean. However, neither was personally close to Putin. That made them the right target for such an operation. World powers have been involved in false flag operations like this before. The most famous instance is the Mukden incident, in which Japanese officers faked a Chinese bombing of a rail line to create a pretext to invade Manchuria. The best part of false flag operations is that it is always easy to find your own proof of the origin of the attack, because you're making it up anyway. If this is a Russian false flag, it signals two underlying problems that Moscow faces. First, it indicates that Russia's military intelligence officials estimate that the current status quo in Ukraine is untenable, and that eventually Ukraine will push the expected outcome of the war back eastward. Kyiv has stalled Russia's advances, and high Mars strikes have perhaps softened up Russia for a counterattack. Maybe Moscow realizes that the only way to stop Ukraine from retaking some or all of its lost land is to raise a larger army. Failing to do so could be backbreaking for Putin's regime. Finishing a costly war without securing any tangible benefits is an invitation for political competitors to overthrow him. It also hints at a second Russian weakness. Putin cannot mobilize those troops under the current political conditions. It has become a joke in the West, but Russia still classifies the invasion as a special military operation. Legally, Putin cannot shift to a widespread military mobilization without declaring a war. A false flag attack would indicate that Putin does not believe such an act would be politically popular, at least under current conditions, and therefore needs to do something to move public sentiment. Pointing the finger at someone else is the solution. We may be observing the first step of this. Five days after the attack, Putin ordered an increase of about 137,000 troops beginning in January 2023. Number 2. A Ukrainian Attack Straight from the FSB, this is the official explanation Russia has given. A Ukrainian operative, originally from the Azov Regiment, the East Ukrainian military group from Mariupol that is the basis for Putin's nebulous argument that the invasion is intended to denazify Ukraine, entered Russia on July 23rd along with her daughter. She then moved into the same Moscow apartment complex as Dugina's and spent the next month meticulously planning the attack. Upon its completion, she drove to Estonia and is now somewhere in the European Union. This explanation raises more questions than it answers. There is consensus that Ukraine has been hitting targets across its border into Russia. This includes the Milorovo Air Base at the start of the war. Ukraine has also hit Russian annexed Crimea, including the Saki Air Base. But those places have been much closer to the theater of operations and have an obvious military application. Moscow is much, much more distant and Dujina was a civilian. Combined with the vector of attack, this should concern Putin. Imagine that Ukraine indeed has the ability to project unconventional power that far, and has plans to continue doing it. Then Russia will have to invest heavily in domestic countermeasures. 
But then the special military operation will start feeling like a much broader conflict. Moreover, unlike a false flag operation, Putin would not be in control of the targets. The potential for domestic discontent could grow and threaten his regime. Nevertheless, Dugana would be a strange target for the Ukrainian government to go after. She was a journalist and television celebrity, so this should not strike fear into the average Russian citizen. And she did not work for the government, so the attack did not directly target any pertinent decision makers. If Ukraine had the ability to extend so far into Russia, there seemed to be better political and military targets, things that might actually make progress toward ending the war, rather than just occupy news headlines for a week. Russia also has a strong incentive to lie about the origins of the attack. This is especially true if it was a false flag operation, but is also the case for any other origin. The attack may just be a politically convenient way to drum up Russian support for the war, or special military operation. And all of the evidence to go along with it has been conveniently fabricated to fit the narrative. Beyond that, Russia has another incentive to lie that connects to our third explanation. This is an attack by Russian resistance. Russia has made substantial territorial gains during the war, and now controls about 20% of Ukraine's land. For perspective, that would be as if the United States lost California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Idaho, Arizona, and Montana. But the initial push toward Kyiv was a disaster, and six months into the war, Russian casualties likely far exceed what the Soviet Union experienced in the entirety of the Afghanistan war from the 1980s. Putin has held on to power and maintained relative popularity because disproportionately few of those casualties are coming from Moscow or St. Petersburg, the power centers of Russian politics. It is reasonable to think that partisan groups may be forming and hiding in plain sight within Russia, aiming to create domestic instability and overthrow Putin's regime. Yulia Ponomarev, the only member of Russia's parliament to vote against the annexation of Crimea in 2014, and who now lives in exile in Ukraine, made the claim that the attack was the work of the National Republican Army, an up until then unheard of militant group. There is very little to corroborate that claim, but it is consistent with how militant groups operate. It may seem strange that an organization would want to reveal its identity. Finding them becomes easier, and so Russian security forces are more likely to strike back. However, both the violence and the credit claiming are standard behaviors due to an incentive that political scientists call outbidding. To survive, such organizations need funding and manpower from a more general audience. They use attacks as a bizarre form of advertisement to achieve those ends. Credit claiming is a natural extension to that. This would also help make sense of the target. A celebrity keeps the story in the news for longer and keeps the group's name circulating, while still not drawing the full wrath of the Russian government that might arise if the target had been a political power player. The deeper concern for Putin here is that an attack by such a group signals larger underlying resentment for his regime than we would expect otherwise. A group would not accept the risks that come along with an assassination plot if they did not think there would be large-scale rewards for doing so. That means that the group anticipates that there is a large pool of potential supporters that will come to them with money and to volunteer their services. It is also consistent with Russia's claim that the attack came from Ukraine. As we have discussed before, the strength of an autocratic ruler depends on citizens expecting other citizens not to resist. That's because any individual citizen would not want to go out and protest if they knew no one else was. Doing so is a one-way ticket to jail. But there is safety in numbers, and individuals might not want to miss out on the Revolutionary Party. Gotta get those picks for the socials, after all. Acknowledging that the attack came from within signals that there is growing anti-regime support. That can create a self-fulfilling prophecy of anti-regime protests, 
and that is something that Putin wants to avoid at all costs. This takes us to the final possibility, number four, a random act of violence. Of all the options, this one is the least interesting from a strategic perspective. It could be that this was an act without a deeper meaning, or perhaps a personal vendetta unconnected to the current war. Car bombings were somewhat commonplace in Boris Yeltsin's Russia during the 1990s. Ironically, one of the reasons for Putin's popularity within the country is because there has been relative domestic peace during the Putin era. It still looks bad that Russian police forces did not stop the attack, but this kind of thing happens in countries that are not otherwise embroiled in a war at all. And those are four interpretations of what happened. Which do you think is most likely? Let me know in the comments. If this topic interests you, you'll love my book on the causes of the war in Ukraine. Check below for more information on that. And if you already have read it, please leave a review. It really helps out. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And I will see you next time. Take care.